Hi, I'm Dick Gale, jazz musician and drummer, and uh, this is episode nine, and I want to start nine with closing out eight properly. After that, my wife reminded me, after that, I never let anybody tune my drums. I wouldn't care if it was God. You'd have to wait until, you know, we got a day or two off, and then I might let you fidget with. There are some exceptions, Donald Bailey, because we played so much alike, and Bernard Purdy. But you find out with great drummers, they don't want to touch your drums. They'll sit down and play them cold and play them better than you. That even makes you feel worse. So, anyway. So, uh, here we are leaving New York with Roy Liberto and, and the All-Stars, and we're going to... We're going to Cleveland. We're going back to Cleveland to work the theatrical again. And, of course, I, now I have people waiting for me in Cleveland. And I was playing on weekends steady. And uh, I was filling in with Joe. I was playing two nights a week with him while I was in town with Joe Alexander. And we had a great organ player. Now, I've been looking for him. I haven't been able to find him. His name was Leotis Harris, and he was the nicest guy. Leota spent some time with me, but Joe spent a lot of time working with me to get me to understand how things are, how things lay, and how to play certain things, and how to think about certain things when I get to them. Um, some guys like to, here's the note, here's the time, it's like this, and some guys like to play here. A lot of guys think that playing way up here is the only place to play. Joe liked to play right in here. He hated to rush things and play things on the edge. He liked things much more relaxed because it gave him so much more freedom. We were playing up there on a Sunday night, and some people that I knew that had been coming in the club all the time, said, uh, we're going over to so-and-so's house and we're going to play some cards. Um, you want to come with us? So I said, yeah, I'll come over. I said, but I got some people I got to meet about some gig that was coming up or something. I said, so what I'll do is I'll drive you over and drop you up and then you call me and I'll come and pick you up and then I can stay for a while. And they said, okay. So I took them up to the house, and I dropped, and it was right kind of in the area on Upper Euclid somewhere. And I dropped them off, and I got back to the club, and I had been in the club about 25 minutes, and they called me, and they said, Dick, you got to come and pick us up right away. So I went up, and I picked them up, and I got back to the club, and they all sat down. We were all sitting down in our booth in the back. There was nobody there, and this is the story that I got. They went into the house to play cards, and when they went in, the guy that owned the house had some wine and some beer and was getting the wine and the beer, and they were getting glasses and put them on the table. And uh, he was getting some food and stuff out of the refrigerator, so everybody was getting situated. I think there were four or five guys. And one of the, and in those apartment buildings in Cleveland, the two, three tenements, this was a two tenement house, they said. Uh, the, when you walked in the front door, the living room was here, and then there was a bedroom here, and then the kitchens and that were off to the side, like my house back in Albany. And one of the guys happened to go by the doors the clothes to block off the living room or the dining area from the bedroom. And the doors were open and he looked through the doors and he could see a woman laying on the bed. And he had looked in close enough not knowing what to see that the woman laying on the bed never moved her eyes, at least that's what he said. And so he opened the door and looked in a little bit more, and she still never moved. So he got one of the other guys, and he said, hey, there's something wrong with the woman. And they both looked, and they opened the door. So meanwhile, the guy that owns the apartment, I guess, is still getting 
food or drink, whatever he was doing. He opened the doors and they went in and the woman was laying dead on the bed with a dog chain wrapped around her throat and one end of the dog chain over the post on the four poster bed. And she was cold and discolored, he said, because when he touched her, she was cold. And uh, they just backed out of the room and started wiping shit off and they told everybody and they got out of there and they called me and I went and picked them up. And he sat in the house for three days. And finally one of the guys dropped a dime. And they went and they arrested him and he's doing life. First, he murdered her in the middle of an argument. Because they said that when they said something to him on the way out of the house, he kept saying, no, 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 she's not dead, she'll be all right. She, we just had an argument, she'll be okay, she's gonna wake up in a minute. He said, and that really scared the shit out of everybody. That was, uh, was a hell of a story.